my line again? I don't know, you made it up. Over the last few years, Bhavak Gandhi has been responsible for 199 film ideas, none of which have been made. I'm Travis Winthrop, and today we catch him on the precipice of his 200. Sometime around 2013, when Rob Delaney was regarded the funniest man on Twitter, Bhavak Gandhi replied to a message he'd written about his fart. The next morning, he woke to find his response had been retweeted and Hollywood was calling. Three agents and a junior assistant in Beverly Hills were following him. Trying to hold their attention, Babak started pitching film ideas within the allocated 150 characters. The first of these was Elephant in the Room, a noir mystery. Fast forward to 2017, and while at home, sit, Babak started to write his ideas in ink and post onto Instagram, where he has found a more receptive audience. We catch him today as he hits film idea 200, having seen the preceding 199 take him on shows stretching from Margate to Salisbury. I've come to learn about his process. Hello, Babak. Um, hi, Travis, and thanks for coming to see me today. This is to celebrate Rough Trade Book's second birthday. Are you surprised what film ideas got published? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, any time I go into a project, I, I don't really have a game plan or realise that I'm in the middle of a project of any kind. So. I suppose I am very surprised, especially being in amongst so many um, amazing people in that Rough Trade family. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because from an outsider's perspective, it looks like you just write down whatever rubbish comes into your head. Hmm, it's getting mean. Have you seen how hard my maths homework is? Do you think this is an example to set to a future generation? Um, well, I mean, I wasn't thinking I was going to be an example to future generation. I guess I didn't think about being an example to future generation. I just, and I was just writing rubbish that came into my head. You're right. But I think it's okay. I think it's okay for adults to be silly. Um, more, more adults need to, to embrace things. Maybe they don't, because then maybe I won't poke out. I don't know what I'm saying, but I mean, if you need help with your maths, I can I can give it a go. Factorise two x squared plus five x plus three. But what's what's the question? Factorise. Oh. Film idea. Last tango in Paris. Tensions flare when a tango delivery to Paris is derailed by terrorists. You seem to be stuck on this 200 number. Why? I mean, that maths question didn't even have... Was it? Like a trick question? I mean, it didn't even have an equals. You've got to have an equals. Otherwise, there's just words and... Words and numbers. What was your question? Why are you stuck on 199 film ideas? I guess I, I haven't done one for a while, and this is why I thought, you know, adults need to embrace silliness because it expresses a sort of freedom in thought, and things get quite hard, and things are hard now. And, but you have to be brave and you have to write the thing that you think will get people through. And if I'm honest, I want to write Chicken Nugget City. And I just don't have, and, and, and I think I will. Over the last few years, Babak's film ideas have generated a lot of comments, such as, This is funny, and I like that to things like, why are you still doing this? 
Some of the biggest hits include I'll Be Back. Arnold Schwarzenegger plays the German composer Hellbent on Revenge. Pants Day. A man is committed to spending the day in his pants, even though the lion has escaped from the zoo and a killer is on the loose. Roast. Terrorist strike, just as Jason Statham has put the chicken in. Now he's got one hour and 20 minutes plus resting time to clean things up. Cat flap time machine. A cat travels through different dimensions with total indifference, thanks to a fault in his cat flap. Hokey cocaine. When a bag of cocaine is mistaken for flour, a six-year-old's birthday party takes an emotional turn. Tell us more about Not My First Rodeo. It's the most popular of the series, right? Yeah, it's proved to be one of the more popular ones. Um, Not My First Rodeo... I don't know where it came from. I mean, I, I heard somebody say, this isn't my first rodeo. And I just put myself in the um, mind of a cowboy. I thought, well, if it's not my first rodeo. So, what are your personal favourites? Personal favourites? Um, they're often not the ones that are the most popular. And I think that's the case with this. And um, there's so many. I mean, you can have the product placement and uh, check the check the pamphlet. But my favorite, I think, one of my favorites was called Catapultism, which was um, it's here. I can read it. A film illustrating the rise of capitalism by documenting the development of the second ever cat food company. Just like a Coen Brothers film, like the Hubsock Proxy, or Mad Cross with Mad Men. I mean, I, I thought that was genius because you know what I've done there is I've swapped the P in capitalism with the T in cat. Oh, there's another one actually. This one that's on the wall here called New Balls, Please. Um, a male tennis player who gets a sex change and wants to reverse it because he realises that women's tennis is hard. Um, and it's clever because it's a double meaning because in tennis if you hit the ball out the umpire will often shout new balls please. And also you know, new balls. So, do you think making this number 200 will be a significant mark? Will this be the end, or is it just a monkey you need to get off your back? Is there a monkey on my back? Um, no. I'm, I've just been lazy. I lost my nerve a bit. Um, and then it like drags on and it becomes sort of symbolic and everyone's like, Oh, what's the 200th film going to be? Uh, what, what, what is it? Like, you know, some of them, some of them have been sort of autobiographical. And it's like, what are you going to do? And it's like, oh, I was going to do Chicken Nugget City. And I am going to do it now. And um, and that will be done. And that will put that chapter to close. And why would I Why would I stop doing film ideas? I mean, look how far it's got me in a, in a short space of, well, if you add it all up, seven years. Um, sure, nobody's asked me to make this film. Um, Sure, you should be doing your homework, but look where we are now. We're, we're still here. Time has come, and behind me you can see Babak Ganji creating the 200th film idea. Let's see how it's going. So, how does it feel to reach number 200? Um, yes. Uh I don't know why it didn't happen sooner. It feels a relief to have got it done. So, let's take a look. It doesn't make any sense. No, I mean, to be honest, it's not one of my best. Um, but as I say, we've... Um, it's all... It's, it's content, isn't it? We, we've got to... We've turned the corner and um, we move on to Monkey on Your Back, Film Idea 201. 
I'm Travis Winthrop and this has been an extremely disappointing end to an extremely disappointing look into the artistic process of Babak Ganji. We're four brown girls who write. I'm Sheena. Hi, I'm Sharon. I'm Roshni. Hello. Um, there's three of us tonight, but um, we've got pamphlets coming out in September. But for Rough Trade Second Birthday, we thought we'd do a socially distanced Zoom performance. Um, so I'll go first. I've not written poetry in mine, but these are poems I have written recently. Uh, so this first one is Fish and Chips off the coast of Essex. The menus flap in the wind. The salt and pepper shaker a lid on the thing I cannot say. Your mouth twisted. I share my chips, but only because they've gone cold and I don't want them. The waitress who keeps forgetting us asks if we're happy, lips a thin line, nodding, not looking, chewing on lemon rinds, scraping fish off the bone. Mm. Um, I love that line um, about the, you share the chips because they're cold. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you do only share things because you don't want them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be generous because I don't you would never do that with Roshi. You don't no, like Roshi get the best cuts of whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll offer her first on okay. <laughs> Um Okay, so my first poem is from the old the book, um, and it's called "How to Lose Your Voice." First, act out the simple things. Step onto the cold, concrete balcony and scream until your throat is cracked glass. Fill up a cup, of cube, fill up a cup with cubes of ice, frozen Coca-Cola and swallow continuously. Allow the cold to cut into your soft pink tissue. Cough, smoke, drink, shout in parties in bars with air clogged and bitter. Smear with lemon. Then childish things. Stop writing, stop drawing, stop singing. Drown out colour, push it under water until it chokes. Stay blank, I don't know, nothing, no idea. Over time, thoughts will turn to dust. The hard things. Stay mute. Stay mute as his voice crushes down like a house of tumbling bricks. Break down your thoughts, scatter them like seeds on his freshly cut grass. Crush your pen, rip up paper until you aren't heard by yourself, by him, by anyone. That's so lush. Very good. That's made me miss crowds, <laughs> even though I know, <laughs> you know, like the. Um, can you tell us, is there a story behind that? Like, what? Can you just tell us a bit of background? Yes. Um, so I wrote that as. Um, so I was doing a writing exercise and it was the one that you sent Rosh there was a there was a booklet of them drummer I don't know what the yeah. name was um, and it gives you the first line of each stanza 
um like first I act out the simple things and childish things and hard things um but I decided to do it um about this meeting I was in at work and it was about losing your voice not not speaking up and some we were in a meeting and we were talking about a poem that I really liked um and I was trying to say my interpretation of it and he just cut me off and um said his interpretation of it and just acted like mine was not right (laughs) but I didn't say anything I kind of let it happen like I let his voice crush mine um and afterwards I was like just felt a bit shit (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure many, many people can relate to that experience in their own way, though. So thank you for capturing it in a poem. I'll just, I'll just say, you, you, I mean, you've, we've had conversations where you say that, where you're like, oh, I didn't know what to say at the time. And then when I, know you, I do it so much, I read, but when you read your work, you know what to say. It's like, that's the space where you say everything that you want to say. That's mm. why it comes, it's like, you're like, wow. And like, it's just like this amazing voice that just just it's literally like above the page oh, thanks Sheens. but it would be useful to have that in a real life yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it's the voice it's timing it's my brain processing things i think really i think you just just accept what it is i mean you save it you put you creatively yeah that's true that, that way also i really love in the shadow on your face Sheens. well yeah. uh, you look like a a beautiful interplanetary being. Oh, <laughs> you can stay. <laughs> you can have a chance. I'll try. <laughs> um, should I read mine? Yeah, go on then. So the first one I'm going to read is called Jazz at the North London Tavern from our book, Four Grand Girls Who Write. Jazz at the North London Tavern. Tips on writing, tips on playing, this pen should last this full set. Roll up, warm up, pen up, pad up, show me how it works. Standard improvised, piece self-penned, segue into chop house. Dark aired blink, superstar unhidden, arpeggio unlearned. Drinks hanging between seats and fingertips untouched. He says... He wants my body, that he'll take it should I offer. It rains outside in Kilburn. We learn to learn to listen. We break hungry attention. We break early affection. This is blues after all, and I'm a lady. (laughs) Green blooded, canal smoked, hazy evenings are nostalgia. He leans past one between us. He speaks to me through stone. He claims he wants me so bad, the ache makes him want to pull his teeth out. Mm. I cannot reply through stone. Still, the click-click of the rim compels him to shove past, places plasticine palm on my thigh. I ask him to only dream of touching. There's jazz to be heard, mess to be cleared, of unwitting obsession, of misread kindness. And so here we have another one drowned in tears and turned to a city of cynics oh you just so that it rains in kilburn i mean it's such a simple sentence it sounds so it's so poetic also just so musical you make me want to dance yeah, you make me want to do this oh, yeah. pull up, pull up. I'm like yes fair. <laughs> i think i wrote i mean i wrote it listening to jazz like listening to a live jazz gig uh, with with some guy who it wasn't a date but who apparently it was a date so. sorry was that? <laughs> I mean it wasn't what was it I mean a plasticine hand I'm guessing you, you weren't enjoying it <laughs> I was enjoying the music but that's all. no really you really come really you can feel it you can hear yeah. it it's not so, you've got such a great sense of rhythm mm. Okay, take it away, Sheena. Make a dirty joke there, but I'm glad I stopped. <laughs> uh, so this is our last round. Um, this is for Roshi. Someday we'll die like this in Rio, I promise. Moving through my living room, 
Footsteps mixed with booze mark the floor. Cups lined with lipstick. Icing thrown on the walls. Credit cards and white powder on the glass table. Pink panties trailing on the floor to the bathroom. The debauched wrinkled bodies of my aged friends heaped and hung over by the swimming pool. Kissing with open mouths. Smoking, admiring my tropical garden. Lush, wild and alive. Dawn light slants through the windows. I will lay my satiated body into bed like soft dark fruit steeped in cream. Mm. So lush. Yes, lush is the word that comes to, to my head too. It's so rich. Mm, thanks. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my phone up so, so you can talk about Sheena's a bit more. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, when I first read that one, I was just like, it just made me think of like Carnival, the, the, the um, what's the word, the revelry and the kind of uh, exaggeration of celebration that comes with Carnival in Rio. And, and you've never been to Rio, have you? Yeah, never. Or like, I guess Carnival, but. Um, in Rio but yeah for me I was just like oh I just want to be it conjured up the so there's a word in Portuguese in Brazil that they use called saudades or saudade, saudade which kind of means a longing or a when you miss something but it's more than that it's deeper than that there's no direct translation in English but it's that like it's it's a longing and a missing when you miss something so much it hurts but it feels so happy at the same time your that poem makes me think of it gives me saudades for Rio so Aww. Encapsulated it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read mine from the pamphlet, Up and Coming, which we're really excited about. <laughs> um, I just want to say you're lit very well right now. Okay, I'll stay exactly like this. Exactly like that. <laughs> um, okay, this one is called Hat, it's from a series of poems all titled hatch and this one is number two hatch two it's a dirty kitchen crumbs on the coffee table an unhoovered dirty floor stains on the bathroom mirror where i avoid looking at myself in the eye it's the hum of the fridge in the silence when she's finally asleep and you just don't know how long it'll last it's wanting to breathe an anxious walk in the park, fresh air cutting your skin, hoping it'll make you feel alive again. It's the wailing baby at midnight and knowing this is it. It's seeing someone fly by on their bike through the crack in the blinds when you're rocking her to sleep, strained 6 a.m. wrists. And it's not ending the poem with her sweet smile that makes it all worthwhile, or the wonder or awe or miracle, but it's the feeling of never ending. It's the hesitant, desperate call for someone to listen, not to the cries, but to the silence. Oh, I just love it. It's so much very cinematic. Hmm. Didn't feel like a cinematic period. No. <laughs> for you it's very visual mm. and I love that bit where you say it could end on like well she's fed and it's fine like it's really nice that it twists at the end to something you don't expect the 6am wrists just got me <laughs> I, was like, I know what you mean <laughs> <laughs> you remember too much <laughs> yeah thank you thank you for sharing that one and to both of you for sharing as always and um yeah normally the four of us would be with sana here as well um so um hopefully the next time you you see us all together it'll be the four of us um in real life sharing how magical would that be amazing um but yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read my next poem, which is also in the next uh, the pamphlet coming out with Rough Trade Books. It's called, We Now Have Air Conditioned Supermarkets. <laughs> the year is 2015. My cousin Roshan tells me, we now have air conditioned supermarkets. In his eyes, 
This is the shining epitome of global civilization. A proud shift from aspiration to participation, from jungles and dust to highways to WhatsApp to Snapchat to TikTok to air conditioned supermarkets. We now have pomegranate. Look, pomegranate, out of season. The single fruit in his palm glistens in a shrink wrapped plastic skin. I've never before seen a pomegranate resemble a ticking, ticking time bomb. I ask him, where has it come from? He cannot say. I want to warn him to throw it, destroy it, devour it. Mm. Love that. Love that. It's like one simple conversation you say about progress, about capitalism, about the global food distribution. There's just so <laughs> much going on in that. About like what is progress? Yeah. Yeah, it is. What? Yeah, it's exactly, it's exactly what I was thinking. Ticking time bomb. I, I, and then all the whole, and you can devour it, but also throw it, try and destroy it. You want to do everything to it. Yeah. Well, that it can hurt you and you can hurt it, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, that I love that one actually. Thanks. Oh, hey. I'm quarantine this forever. <laughs> um, so this is the first time we've like um, read to each other in a really long time. So um, we really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From beautiful. Thank Thanks you for the opportunity. Great. Rough trade books. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's my second birthday because it made us read together. We wouldn't have done this. No, we definitely wouldn't have done this. Yeah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. How should we we end it? No. I thought that was the end. I thought that was the end. (laughs) Then end. Okay, I'm going to end it. No. How are you? Yeah, not bad. How are you? Yeah, good. Yeah, busy. Yeah. It's just life. Yeah, yeah, it's a bad, bad, bad one. Bad one, yeah, bad world. How are you? Yeah. What's going on? Uh, fucking, um, yeah, just last three months of madness, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like, um, well, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll get to this in, in the interview, but it's like, there's lots one, to talk about. <laughs> yeah, there's lots to talk about. One of the, I guess one of the cool things about what you do is that you can be really responsive to what's going on and there's been loads going on and so you've been quite, quite yeah, busy. busy. Yeah, fucking well busy. Uh, but uh, yeah, lucky as well. I mean, my studio is five minutes from where I live, so yeah. I've just been walking down here every day. Uh, yeah, keeping busy. And do you feel like... You know, like, presumably you had plans for this year, um, like when things happen and, and you just kind of go with it, do, do, do you just uh, let all that stuff slide? I mean, I haven't spent any time on my, you know, on other shit for fucking months now, yeah. um, which creatively, I mean, you know, I just started doing something the other day and then, and then you remember what it's like to fucking be creative again. You know, it gets frustrating, you know. You just turn yourself into like a super t-shirt packer and it's uh <laughs> it's not a fun life <laughs> all right that's that's a good place to, to go from so um i was, I was thinking about basically the, the question that writers always get asked is um like when did you first realize you were a writer or when did you first start writing and i know like yeah. your first t-shirt was the free talisa t-shirt but I, I i'm wondering i guess what like when you look back at your your childhood or whatever, is there is there any moment where you think, oh yeah, I could already tell I was like uh, starting to bootleg? Well, yeah, I mean, I was doing weird 
I mean, not weird things, but um, like my dad's best mate had a sports shop in Farnborough, which is called Royale Sports, named after Roy and Alan, his two kids. Right. So, um, so I'd be running around a warehouse full of sportswear, um, and like and selling stuff at car boots, you know, like loads of raffler ends and stuff like that. Um, so uh, turns out they were all uh, uh, fakes from Portugal, which I didn't know at the time. Um, but you were in uh, involuntary bootlegger. <laughs> yeah, basically. Um, but I remember, I remember like printing football football shirts and stuff there because they had like a. They used to print for some some local teams, you know, like school teams or youth teams and stuff, doing like the heat press. Yeah, yeah. So I, I remember making myself like a Team Roses t-shirt to go to Romford Skate Park, um, and then like sewing like Colchester United badges onto like Diodora. Oh, uh, onto, I had like a manager's jacket. Now yeah, I must have been like eleven or twelve, and I got my mum to sew it onto like Colchester United badge onto a Diodora jacket. Um, but I, I had these uh, I had these brown football boots. Have you still got? No, nah, I've not got any of this shit. I've got some photos, um, but I've got, uh, I had these brown football boots called Joma. Do you remember a mate, like Italian mate called Joma? They had like a black fold over tongue and uh, they had silver writing, which was Joma. And I coloured in like the uh, the A and the end of the M. So they both said John on, like, on the fold over tongue. So yeah, it, it seems I've been doing this. Okay, good. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the answer is yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just in terms of the last few months, um, I guess at the start of lockdown and the pandemic, it's be like the NHS t-shirt thing you brought back. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about um, that and, 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 how, and why, you, why you brought it back and what the idea was? Um, well, I, I mean, I did it, you know, I did it like, you know, five years ago or something now for the for the junior doctor strikes um just as a show of support to them at that time um but then obviously this um the, the whole pandemic thing started uh, started kicking off i saw i saw a dj like high wearing wearing the nhs t-shirt on a boiler room they were doing like a fundraiser for some food banks and stuff and then uh, loads of people were asking for for the t-shirt and um and like, I was thinking about printing it, but I didn't just want to print it, you know, without any action attached to it, you know. Like, so it's all too easy just to, like, raising money is easy, you know, and, like, uh, and throwing it into, like, some NHS charities together totalizer, which, you know, I was looking at that. There's, there's uh, 82 million in that, you know, and, and trying to decipher where that money goes, you know. I see, I see some art packs and stuff on the website, but, but, uh, but, um, my housemate, uh, Tommy D, his sister's partner, runs Club Mexicana, which is like a, a, a vegan uh, sort of street food uh, run by women and stuff. And so I spoke to her and I was like, look, you, you know, obviously all your staff must be out of work. You know, um, if I sell T-shirts, can I, you know, I'll give you all the money from that, which then employs all these people uh, at local food spots. And then my mate Susie, she's like a, she works at the council in public health. So she, um, she has like a direct link to the different trusts that run the different hospitals so that we could get a point of contact at the ICU units and then drop the food off to them at the same day, every time, like, you know, so just organizing it because mm -hmm. there's got to be organization and structure to it, you know? Um, so we had that going from like March 22nd, really early on, you know, um, and then we delivered daily to five different units and some like social care places. Um, yeah, loads of spots really. Yeah, I saw some, um, I live right next to Hompton Hospital and so I was in, well, mm. my wife was giving birth and so I was just coming out of there and um, saw like- Yeah, have you, yeah have you had a COVID baby? <laughs> uh, yeah, COVID baby, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hopefully he hasn't got COVID, but um, yeah. So I saw, I saw like the, the stand set up with the, with the, with the food being given away. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, and so that was one thing. And also the, I, lo I love the COVID letters, which um, I actually never got that, that letter, but. Um, yeah, I, did, I didn't get one at my house either. I had like, so some arrived at the studio, but I didn't have any at my house. 
So, yeah. so the, the, these were letters that were sent out to like 30 million homes or something from the government kind yeah. of, um, well, you can tell me what, 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 what they, they were letters advising people to do all the things we, we, we know we should do, um, of stay home and, and, all, and all that kind of thing. But what, yeah. what was your idea to, to kind of run with that? I just, I just woke up in the morning, so an added me and said they'd received their, their NHS t-shirt through the post at the same time as one of those letters. And they said, oh, one of these is going in the bin. So I was just lying in bed. I was like, oh, I must be able to do something better with that. And then, you know, I realised there was all these letters across the UK. And um, we can just use that as a, you know, sort of as the canvas um, for like a poster comp for the kids who were in lockdown, you know. So, um so under 16s and not use any digital just draw straight onto the thing and um and send them send them in set up a po box like any any proper comp should have um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that was amazing that was amazing I, I i didn't realize you know how how much joy it would bring to me and the kids and the families and and it would get so many entries you know what was your uh, favorite entry I, entries oh, we got about 230 entries like so um they've all been coming back still still got a load more to receive and then uh i've got like probably like a top five but i'm putting together like a little little panel of judges to to pick the winner like a teacher a nurse you know artist and all that kind of shit so what's the prize uh glory um a 500 quid voucher for the store um but we're putting them we're putting them all into a book and then we're um sorting out an exhibition for them all and stuff so yeah it's kind of it's, it's not finished yet That's and amazing. then the more, the more the more the kids are engaged you know like some of them are sending me like their own personal pirate homework now so are you, wearing, are you wearing the pirate right now yeah it's a bit of that yeah <laughs> gotta get some um, so I want to talk about like, there's this recurrent theme in your in your work of the the I don't even know how to pronounce it is it Harris Spence Harris Spence oh Harris yeah 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 so yeah. like why is that I'm coming at you with like the poet hat on like, why is that an important image uh, well I was, I was at a rave with my with my housemate and uh, we were just surrounded by Harris fencing um, which then actually you realise you at every sort of, you know, rave or festival, you know, the the, the Harris fence is, is is present, you know? It's like the, the kind of archetypal security fence for like a nightclub queue, right? Yeah, nightclub queue, like, you know, festival surroundings, um, you know, building sites. It's it's basically, you know, it's a barrier. Is um, it... Is it, is it is it the kind of waist high one or is it the, the like full body? Uh, the waist high one is uh, called a, a met, met barrier, but the, the full, full size one, All right. seven, seven by eight foot, that's, that's Harris fence. Yeah. I've got some hanging up. Hold on. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> See that. So. Wait, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's Harris. See, I was imagining it. That's a lot more intimidating. Than I, and I, I kind of thought it was like the kind of uh, just the kind of casual waist high, but that's a proper like KGN type. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's proper that. Like the most satisfying thing is when you see it kind of not upright, but all stacked. Like you know, graphically, it's just like you know, and you and you're not penned in by it. So it's, it's quite a satisfying thing when you see stacks of it. But it's another one in bits of a. Uh, you know, it's, it's like a bit of street furniture. You see it every day of your life, but you don't kind of acknowledge it. It's one of the things like you see an IKEA bag every fucking day. You know, um, once you draw people's attention to Harris Fence, like they see it everywhere now. You know, now people send me pictures of fucking Harris Fence, so which makes me happy. But um, but yeah, so the music, like, so we do we do a record label based off that, and then. You know, send it, send a load of pictures of Harris Fence to producers and, and say, make something that sounds like what this looks like, which is generally hard, obnoxious, industrial, but design classic. I think it's, so. yeah, but, but, but design classic, okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to... I guess it's one of those things, like, I can even feel 
I can't even imagine how it feels to grip one, you know, like all those times you've like looked through at a construction site or something, like even the spacing of it feels really like tactile. But yeah, like, even, even when you're in a queue, like, you know, when the wind catches it, there's a slight, you know, there's a slight yeah, rust. There's what, a slight rust. Note, uh, what note does that? That should be the baseline. Get the producers, yeah. get them to, to sample it. I mean, I, 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 I remember, walk, you know, I've walked miles with my lighter dragging across one just for the sound of it. Um, you know, that, that's before there was any idea of making, you know, you know, music or record label. It's just one of them things which you, you, you sort of engage with. But, um, but also, see, you know, it's, it's always used as a divider and, you know, we don't really want divides. Let the people in. Fucking don't, don't kettle them or pen them in. Um, so I want to come quickly to your Rough Trade Books pamphlet, which is why we're here. Um, partly why we're here to celebrate Rough Trade Books' birthday. Um, happy, birthday. happy birthday, Rough Trade Books. So Diary of a Bootlegger is your pamphlet, and it's kind of like a behind-the-scenes at Sports Banger, and um, it's got everything from cease and desist letters to uh, complaints from people because the T-shirts, a lot of complaints from people because the T-shirts are late. Yeah. Um, yeah. And loads of other really interesting stuff, lots of it in text messages. And I guess I'm interested in why that kind of transparency is interesting to you. Like, why, why do you value that? Why do you want to put all your dirty laundry in a book? Um, well, I mean, the, if, if people are, you know, if people are sort of investing in it, buying a T-shirt, you know, it's, it's only right they know what the, what's going on. Um, you know, I've always said, like, if, you know, if people support me, then I support other people. Um, but also, you know, I, I mean, Sports Banger is, you know, it might, it's, uh, it's honest, you know, that's, that's, that's all I can say. It's, a, it's an honest brand. It, um, you know, it might be, you know, slightly fucking cowboy, but, um, but, you know, we try our best and, and, uh, you know, doing it for the right reasons. And it, it one of the things in the pamphlet I really liked, which I remember you telling me about before, is you is you were contacted by Rolls Royce at one point. Oh, did, yeah. did you get a lot of brands kind of getting in touch to to try and I guess feed off that honesty or, or, or to get things going? Presumably you must do. I've had a lot of brands in touch. Yeah, um, I've, had, I've had a lot of offers as well, but uh, I. Uh, but also I hear that a lot of brands are scared to get in touch because they, you know, because they're worried that I'll screenshot their email and, and put it online for everyone to read. Um, right. Which, you know, I kind of like being in that position because if you're going to send a fucking stupid email, then, you know. Yes. Like, but you know, yeah, exactly. It puts the pressure on them to actually. Um, yeah, I just, you know, just, just people think a bit more. Just like, just be a bit more considered. You know, and if you approach me in a certain sense to do something, it's just like we, you, you have no idea kind of what I do or what I'm about, and your email's proved it. So, mm. you know, um, just uh, yeah. And what and, and 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 when you're making that decision, obviously you work with Slazenger on Slazenger Bangalore. Like when you're making that decision about who you do work with, what what's it based on? Like, I, I, I the reason I mentioned the Rolls Royce story is because I remembered you were like, I, there's one thing. You, you could do for me and can you can you tell that story about what what rolls royce ended up doing but they well they they just got in contact they were like look can we we want to come to your sh studio and visit it um and then i was like yeah that's fine come you know they, they like to be across design whatever's going on just across design like you know the reason you buy, buy a rolls royce is not because it's like you know suddenly an entry into like a muscle car club you can go and drive around a track at the weekends people are investing in the design process you know it'd be like a two-year wait you know you, you go down to the factory you're engaged with the process you know and choosing what paint and wood and all these different little parts and you know surrounded by the sights and smells and all that kind of stuff so um so they just wanted to kind of just see my sort of design process and then um and then they were like look do you want to come to our factory and see our design process so they they sent a driver and a car and uh Drove me like three hours with my ham sandwich to the factory to have a look around, which was fascinating. Um, but that was that. But then, like the second fashion show I did, like my my dad was coming, um, my brother, my stepmom, 
my 93 year old nan um she was coming they've never sort of been in my you know in my world like to experience all this stuff so um so to hit them in the face with like you know 18 subs you know lasers lights uh loud music voguing like you know just just you know drugs just the whole lot in one fell swoop was like was amazing um but also i was like, I was like how the fuck do i get them out of here you know once once the show's finished because i want to rave and have a raz so it's it about it's about r3 on a wednesday wednesday morning like uh i just sent an email going oh hi just just wonder if i could uh have a driver and a rolls royce to take my nan home after the show um they called in the morning the next day and they sorted it out which is wicked so and then my nan, my nan had had like a really hard week because she uh her like her bag got cut from underneath and her purse nicked and all that and you know she was um she lives out in greenford so she's having a bit of a hard time but then after that she couldn't stop speaking to her mates about her raven rolls experience so um, <laughs> that, that was wicked i like, loved that that is the way to live a raver. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of like the fashion shows, have you got more of that stuff coming up? Like, what, 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 what's the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More fashion shows, more fashion, more music, uh, more everything. You know, uh, I say last few months have been just pretty full on. Um, just you know, doing doing all these t-shirts and just like navigating through this period of pandemic, which. It's probably only going to get worse, to be fair, you know, with all the unemployment that's set to come. There's going to be no Christmas presents under the tree this year. Um, and all I was thinking through this whole period is like, you know, when, when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was get out of the house. Like my mum was in the back room, you know, dying, like terminal illness. She just, you know, you just want to get out of the house all the time. And then just imagine that situation across thousands of kids up and down the country, you know, not being able to leave the house and, you know, and with your immune system and, and all that kind of stuff like like you know that breaks your heart so just uh just anything with sports banging it can be a voice or something for these kids because you know that narrative is never uh you know that's that's not out there for people for people to hear you know there's there's narratives like you know in music like you know if you're from a crime family and all this and that's celebrated and cool and stuff but the coolest fucking thing is like kids that are carers that's fucking cool you know but they're like they're like you know those voices aren't heard so um just uh just just putting some of that across like you know people are starting to listen more i've been doing this for fucking years but it's nice people are listening a bit more now and things are a bit more considered you know yeah that's great man well um i feel like that's I don't want to say any more than that. that that's fucking amazing. I, I, I hope it um, happens in all the right ways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you, know, you, you, see, you see all these brands like scrabbling for a new message and a, and a new narrative to push and, and just what is their messaging and, and, you know, and the machine is broke, you know, across music, across fashion. Is it, is it, you know, it's not sustainable. It doesn't work. You know, you've got all these middlemen, all these agencies and stuff. It just doesn't fucking work. Um, and I'm lucky that I'm, you know, that I'm, I'm stubborn and I do my own thing. And, um, and I haven't had to change anything, you know. I'm just still doing what I have been doing. Um, so, yeah, I'm fucking lucky in that respect. But, you know, the truth always comes out. Time reveals all. And so people are realising that, you know, maybe this is a better fucking format than these bloody big exploitative you know brands which are elevated to these high levels you know right especially when you see how quickly they cannibalize every kind of um you know right on angle how, how quickly every advert was about our key workers and every every advert was about jumping on like it's fucking revolting you know yeah, yeah. and it, this is why I have, you know i have a love-hate relationship with that you know the NHS T-shirt. Like me, it come from a per, you know a, a personal place. When you put something out there like that, you you don't have control over you know how it gets consumed. You know, so if you put music out there, you don't know who's going to buy that music or where it's going to sit in their CD collection and alongside what other music. You know, and then you know there's well, people probably, yeah. there's, there's people that will buy the fucking T-shirt just so they can like you know prance about and have a little photo, and it's just like 
you know, the, the idea is that it's a byproduct of, you know, of providing, you know, jobs for these out of work, you know, um, independent food businesses. Yeah. It's food for the workers and it, you know, and it's a 360 thing. Didn't want no like, do- donations and stuff, but then, but then all these brands fucking rubber stamping a logo on fucking everything, you know, they didn't get fucking five, you know, legal warnings from the government. Like they, they were, they weren't engaged in like the junior doctors like five years ago. This is, you know, but um, that's uh, makes me think of all the bands that have to always um, make a public statement when President Trump uses their music in one of his like, uh, yeah, you know, like Dexy's Midnight Runners had to make a statement. We do not approve. Pre- yeah. Trump coming out to our to our tunes, yeah. yeah. But you've but got I, you've got you've got a personal like you've got a family connection to the NHS, right? Yeah, like my mum was a mental health nurse, and then obviously you know she you know she had a two year you know fight with leukemia. Um, my nan was like she was like a you know one of the founding members of you know NHS when that started. I mean she was like a senior senior nurse in uh, up in Fleet, she's like a ward sister. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's, there's, there's family history and relationship there. So I think, yeah. Um, so what I, oh yeah, I want to, this, I, I had to dig into some, um, friends, I guess, I don't, I think my friend Ruth maybe went to school with you anyway. I digged in to try and get some, some, some like, uh, more, um sideways questions for you i i wonder if you can tell me what the words free shit salt grit mean to you ah oh, yeah uh that was my mate my mate leo uh he uh he i used to work for a place that, uh, called kung fu like media but they, they used to do like the original hip-hop nights and like flyer packs and stuff like that mm. so i worked for them and then through that period, just on the side of the actual work, they would just, um, just do, just do shit. You know, I, like one thing was, um, one thing I remember them doing was, uh, getting like clear polythene bags, putting things in them, books or, or, or whatever, and then putting free shit salt grit stickers on and then putting them in loads of different salt grit containers across, you know, across London. That's one of the things which you see every day, but you sort of don't take any notice of them. Then they put locations up and the idea is you take something out of the salt grit container and you put something back in. So they started this swap shop across London in salt grit containers, um, which, which went for a bit. Then Time Out did a, you know, did a feature on it and then they stopped it. So right. yeah, but they used to do loads of stuff like life drawing buskers at the ICA. Just, it, it was sort of a cute, you know, it was it's one of the informative things where you see someone just doing something because they've had the idea. And like I'm, I'm sure that's yeah, that's that's played an influence in you know any idea I have, I like to do it, you know. Right. Yeah. And and this is like one of those questions that I, I never know whether people hate answering or not. But like like where do you you know do your ideas come from? Like do you have where you go? Are you like reading the newspaper or is it? Are you just kind of like your yeah, idea? Like, yeah, I, li- I, I listen to all the radio, you know. I listen to all the, the radio phone ins, like, you know, I read across different medias and, and newspapers. Like, and you're an LBC guy. Say again? Are you listening to LBC? Yeah, I give that a good go. Um, but just for like, just because, you know, the nature of my t shirts, like, you, you know, the I suppose the, the, um, I've got to be across all that shit, whether I like it or not. Do you know what I mean? I've got to consume all this shit just, just to have a, like, a general, like, you know, oversight of, you know, what's going on how people are thinking you know stuff you hear on the bus everything is you know it's uh you know you can you can close your eyes but you can't close your ears like you know you you've got you've got to listen to people um and then yes yeah, so that's that's kind of how i work yeah and and and, and do you have a lot of i, I quite like your you seem quite collaborative do you have a lot of people around you to like bounce ideas off or how does it work yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got, I've got a good, a good gang, um, you know, dear friends. I mean, the best, the best thing I've ever spent money on is people's wages. You know, like 
I haven't got a fucking house or nothing. Like I, you know, I, I, you know, I do all this stuff. I'm trying to build something, um, and that and that involves people. You know, like sports bang is basically a celebration of 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 people and friends. You know, I can't do any of this shit by myself, um, but I can have an idea and then just put it all together. You know, so yes, it's it's it's, uh, it's it's a fun, exciting place to work, and it's fucking weird. <laughs> um, can we get a little tour of of, of the studio before we go? Mm. Walk around. Yes. Yeah. Do you want it now? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what you can see or not. Do I turn this round? No. <laughs> Outside. Beautiful. Tottenham. Inside. Uh, there's a load of stock there. And then kind of trying to make a display unit there with some lights and all that shit. That's one of the best things I bought. Photocopier printer. Um, desk. Reebok. Uh, that's the kitchen. Well, just a sink and decks and that. Sound system, built that sound system. Sub down there. Uh, work in progress, toilet, archive, that's all the good fashion shit. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It's fucking like this, this place changes like month in, month out. It's like a character itself. It's, it's, you know, we knocked down that back wall. We put a door on the back and rolled a shutter there. Constantly, constantly changing. Um, so yeah. But that's this. That's not the shop, right? The shop is. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. It is also the shop. This is yeah. It's been more studio than shop for the last year or so. Okay. Um, in fact, when we say shop, I haven't actually opened it as a shop for about a year. Right. So. Uh, I'm looking to get another space where I can store all my stuff and then make this more, you know, just just the uh, the workspace and and stuff like that. So, um, cool. Well, thanks, Johnny. I'd better um, clear out because my mum and dad have got to sleep in this room now. But um, <laughs> <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah. nice. Uh, nice. but nice to speak to you, man. And hopefully, see you in the human flesh at some point. Yeah, you too. Yeah, fuck knows how this is going to pan out, but. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give, it, give it best shot. But I've got some exciting shit coming up, which I'm yeah really excited about. Um, and it's bigger and better than before. So yeah, happy about that. Can't wait. Yeah. Well, see, see, Love see, we, we, that, that was some all right words, was it? Perfect. Loved it. Yeah, it was really good. I think I think uh, Nina's got to edit it down to like you know. Yeah. Fifteen twenty minutes. The good bits. Good bits, yeah. She'll she'll make us sound beautiful. Yeah, wicked. <laughs> uh, cool, man. Take care of yourself. And, um, right. Take nice care. Fun. Yeah. Cheers. Good. See you soon. birthday rough trade books i'm gonna do some poems here's some flowers and a cocktail i'm gonna do some poems to wish you a very happy birthday mm-hmm you ready okay this first one is written i wrote it the other morning i think i'm gonna call it missing the portaloos or i might just call it dawn rain but it goes exactly like this i love Dawn rain, blackbird singing in the tree. The rain washes yesterday away. 
Midsummer rain smells so good. The word is petrichor, leafy intoxication. The drunk trees, soaked earth, giggling streams. My roses are getting hammered. The rain reminds me of festivals. You and me laughing and staggering back through the campsite, trying not to wake anyone up. The burn of rum on my tongue, tapping patter of rainfall on tent canvas. The wisps of wet bonfire smoke, trying to remember where we are, eking out the last of the mischief before the noise of people's wants, before the sound of brushing teeth, before we have to pretend we slept, before the smell of coffee talk. Why do people that drink coffee have to talk about coffee so much? Are you in artist camping? I don't even remember where the van is. I thought I heard you singing, singing in the rain singing in the dawn like a blackbird you know i love the world so much i love the world when it is all mud and dreams thank you very much <laughs> so that's a new poem and then the next poem i'm going to do is from the pamphlet pessimism is for lightweight yellow um, and the poem I'm going to do is Pessimism is for Lightweights, published by Rough Trade Books and available everywhere. <laughs> Think of those that marched this road before and those that will march here in years to come. The road in shadow, the road in sun, the road before us and the road all done. History is watching us and what will we become? This road is all flags and milestones, immigrant blood and sweat and tears, built this city, built this country, made this road last all these years. This road is made of protest and those not permitted to vote and those that are still fighting to speak with a boot stamping on their throat. There is a power and strength in optimism to have faith and to stay true to you. Because if you can look in the mirror and have belief and promise you will share wonder in living things, beauty, dreams, books, art, love your neighbour and be kind and have an open heart, well then you're already winning at living. You speak up, you show up and you stand tall. It's silence that is complicit. It's apathy that hurts us all. Pessimism is for lightweights. There is no straight white line. It's the bumps and the curves and the obstacles that make this road yours and mine. Pessimism is for lightweights. This road was never easy or straight, but I know living is all about living alive and lively and love will conquer hate. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Rough Trade Books. Finale!